Hi there, it's Nelifa here from Doha Debates. I'm on lockdown here in my house in London, just like you are, wherever it is you are self-quarantining in the world. Now we're living through unprecedented times, times that will change the world forever. How we respond to the coronavirus pandemic will affect our future, but it also gives us an opportunity to remake it. I talked to one of the world's most famous intellectuals, Yuval Noah Harari, whilst the coronavirus was still developing in China. Harari's multiple best-selling books cover the breadth and depth of human history and ideas. We discussed what divides and unites people in modern times, the future of humanity, the potential benefits of technology, and the rise of digital dictatorships. But first, I really wanted to know how he thinks about these broad trends in history that define us. Because some of the stuff that you've done is quite life-changing for a lot of people who read it, or thought-provoking at least. So how do you do that? I'm interested in big questions, and I let the question lead me wherever it goes. I mean, I don't remain within the confines of a single discipline. Usually, if you are really engaged with a big question, you'll have to cover, I don't know, half a dozen disciplines at least. If you're thinking about uh, capitalism, so if you only stay within economics, you won't understand anything. You can't understand capitalism if you don't take into account uh, psychology, if you don't take into account ethics, if you don't take into account ecology. We covered a lot of ground in our conversation, and since then, the coronavirus has changed almost every aspect of our lives. But what's remarkable is that Harari's thoughts are even more salient now in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yuval Harari has written about globalization and how it unites people horizontally, but divides them vertically. And we're seeing this play out with the coronavirus, which has spread like wildfire across our interconnected world, whilst also highlighting class divisions and issues of access to a steady paycheck, to healthcare, to even clean water, depending on where you live. We see that not only people are more and more connected all over the world, so your life is very intimately affected by an epidemic in China, by a political crisis in the US, by an economic crisis in uh, South America. It can have immediate effect on you. Right. So mo for most of history, people lived in small uh, units so if you lived, we are now in Amsterdam, if you lived in, in the Netherlands a thousand years ago and there was an economic crisis in China, who cares, <laughs> who knows even about it? So we are much more connected, but we are also much more alike. Our political systems, our daily life are much more similar. We now have a single political model all over the world, right. which is the nation state. Yeah. And you know, in a thousand years ago, you have different empires, city-states, tribes. Now you have different regimes, but the basic political structure is the same. You look at economics, it's the same economic system all over the world. It's the same corporation, it's the same uh, uh, currencies. One of my favorite example is the World Football Cup. That you know, you get people from Argentina and Japan and Germany playing games together in Russia, and they all agree on the same rules. A thousand years ago, this was absolutely un unthinkable. So this is globalization, making just, you know, the world into a single unit. Mm. But the danger is, again, that whereas the whole world becomes a single unit and the life of people everywhere becomes more and more similar, you see greater divisions between different classes. So the billionaire in uh, the Persian Gulf and the billionaire in Tokyo and New York, their lives are more and more similar. Yeah. But the billionaire in the Persian Gulf and the workers who are building the stadium for the 2022 World Cup in, in, in Qatar, they have completely different yeah. lives. One other thing I'm really interested about your work, um, Yuval, is this idea of xenophobia being yeah almost in our DNA. I mean, you put it in those stark terms. Yes. That's really, really powerful. And when I read that, I just felt so deflated, but also I want to understand, do you think xenophobia is part of being a homo sapien? You know, xenophobia characterizes not just human beings, it characterizes almost all social animals, certainly all the great apes. Uh, there are amazing research on chimpanzees that shows that 
you know, you show a picture of a strange chimpanzee to a chimpanzee, and the chimpanzee immediately reacts with uh, a heightened tension and aggression. Wow. So it's, it's not just human beings. It makes a lot of evolutionary sense, but it doesn't mean it is our destiny. We need to be aware of our evolutionary legacy. We can't, uh, we can't understand ourselves unless we take it into account, but our evolutionary legacy is not our destiny. We can change the way we behave. Um, and even if you think about something like nationalism, nationalism actually, in order to build a nation, you must overcome xenophobia. People think that nationalism is also in our genes. Evolutionarily speaking, from a biological perspective, we are, we are kind of programmed to feel attached to a very small group of people we know personally, 100, 150 maximum, uh, but not to millions of strangers we never met. So even to build a, mo a nation of millions of people, you need to somehow overcome this inherent tendency to fear and hate people you don't know, because you don't know most of the people in your nation. Right. So, even to build a nation, I mean, many people think that nationalism and xenophobia go together, but no. To build a nation, you need to make people care about people they never met. Like I pay my taxes, so that so somebody in the other side of the country, which I never met, I don't know anything about this person, still I give some of my money so that they will have good healthcare or good education. I mean, we, we fought wars over identity yeah. and nationhood. Mm -hmm. and killed millions of people. So where is this going? What is the future of humanity? And how does it fit into the global context that we live in currently? I think it's up to us. Oh. I mean, again, we, we, we are given these basic abilities like building blocks by biology, but then what we do with them is up to us. Um, again, I don't think that there is any inherent contradiction also between nationalism and globalism. So, okay, we've reached a point when we can cooperate with 10 million people in a nation, but it's our destiny to hate and fight with everybody else. No, because we are facing many global problems like climate change, like the danger of nuclear war, like the rise of artificial intelligence, can only be dealt with if people from many nations cooperate. So, I don't think that Biology doesn't force us to live in any particular way. It gives, it, it builds our basic tendencies, emotions, but then what to do with them, we can build very, very different kinds of societies. What are your hopes of, of us being able to achieve less suffering? Yeah, I think we can do it. Yeah? I mean, if you think about the climate crisis, then the magic number is 2%. Right. The uh, how much would it cost to solve our climate crisis? 2% of global GDP. That's all, just 2%. We don't need to go back living in caves. Now, 2% is still of global GDP is still a lot. It's about the, like the defense budget of humanity, how much we spend on armies. This is how much we need to spend to solve, to solve the climate crisis. But it's doable, it's just 2% of GDP, and it's much cheaper than a world war. If we had World War III, humanity will spend much more than 2% of GDP on that. We can solve it, it's up to whether we want to, whether we have the motivation. And for that, we really need to change the public conversation. As long as you have elections and the main topics in the public debates are terrorism and trade agreements and immigration and not climate change or the rise of AI, then things won't change. Um, so. Part of what we're trying to do is really change the public conversation and focus it on the three biggest problems that humanity faces, which is the threat of nuclear war, it's the ecological crisis, and it's the rise of disruptive technologies like AI and bioengineering. These should be the three topmost subjects in the political debates all over the world.